You're welcome back. Uh, it is said that it is not the population that determines how great a nation can be, but how many people are educated in that country. And so at this moment, we're looking at the role of education in Nigeria's economic development. And we're glad to have joining us Aluko Joshua, Global Great People Foundation president. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning and thank you for having me also. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's begin with what role the education plays in your perspective to the growth of the nation, especially a nation like Nigeria. All right, thank you so much um, for having me here. Um, yes, um, education basically is the bedrock of any developed society. Because when you're talking about development, then you're talking about uh, growth. And if you're talking about growth, growth cannot happen without knowledge, without insight. You know, I mean, we talked about the Industrial Revolution, and then um, when you're talking about Industrial Revolution, we talked about, you know, the prior explosion of knowledge, you know, during those times. So basically, there is no growth without um, knowledge, and that is where education comes in, because education is not just about um, the four walls of, you know, going to the four walls of a particular building, but it's about the content of what takes place there, which is, you know, the impact of knowledge. So with knowledge comes growth, with knowledge comes increase, and with knowledge comes um, sustainability. No society has ever thrived or ever grown or ever, you know, made progress without first having the knowledge, the consciousness of the possibilities that lies ahead and how they advantage of it. So this is how education works. Okay. Um, my, my interest in you, before you came on the program, is the fact that um, a young man like you, no matter how enterprising, but a young man like you has taken interest in sponsoring or giving scholarship or paying school fees of uh, students in even tertiary institutions. And it just made me wonder, how do you do this? Okay. Well, what inspired you? So you? Let's let's start with what inspired you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Well, I would say number one, my number one inspiration is God and His love for humanity. Um, and I also remember when I was in school, um, that was I think two hundred level. I remember that um, there was a particular case of two students um, in my university um, who had serious issues with um, their tuition fees. Um, so for some reason, the course rep, as at that time, reached out to me and told me, hey, Joshua, um, can you please help these two ladies to raise funds? Um, they need money for their tuition fees and they need money for upkeep. And it's really, things are really you know, terrible for them. So I said, okay, no problem. So I, I stood in front of the, the class and I spoke to all of them, appealed to them to donate, to help the students. And so the donation went into my account as at that time. And um, we reached out to our parents and all that. And in fact, it was so bad that one of these particular girls um, could not afford money for sanitary part. And she was on her period. So she had blood stains on, on her chair where she sat. And it was pretty embarrassing. So we raised this money. We made payments for the two of them. And that's, I, I didn't know that that, as at that time, was a signal for me of what I was going to do or major in, in, in the nearest future. So from then on, it just kind of, um, it, um, there was an outburst of consciousness, I'll put it that way. And um, by the time I got to 400 level, I was writing my project. As at that time, I had already started making, you know, findings about, you know, how to help more students. As a matter of fact, I remember getting a group of students together. We printed, you know, this little flyer to reach out to students on campus on, you know, donating for students who are on the verge of dropping out of school. And um, it was um, it was a very defining moment for my life because it totally changed the course of my life. I suddenly left school, not thinking of what I could get from the society. I, I left school thinking of what I could give. And by the time I was leaving school, I had already started doing that. And that basically just followed me. And um, 
it's influenced every of my decision, the kind of friends I make, the kind of conversations I engage in. And from then on, it's, it's just been beautiful to see what, what, I mean, what God is doing, you know, in the lives of youths around the country and even outside the country as well. So, yes, that's so, my inspiration. Basically. So you are the local GoFundMe, as it were. <laughs> okay, but uh, so far, how many people have you been able to impact? You, I'm, I'm taking it personally to you because uh, I need to show people that it is possible to, to think of others more than you think of yourself. So if you could do it as a young man, uh, then there are a lot of other people that could do it and, you know, so that the cries in the society may lessen. So I'll be asking you personal things that you do in your space to make sure that people get to know more that things like these are possible. So how many people have you been able to reach out to? Now it is not your thing. I, I see that you are having a Global Great People Foundation. You are the president, gang gang, but you, know, <laughs> you, have, you have a team around you. So this team of yours, how many people have you been able to reach? And how do you select the people that become beneficiaries? All right, thank you so much. Um, yes, so since 2015, we, we, we registered officially with Public Affairs in 2015. So from 2015 till last night, um, we had sponsored 1,411 1, students since 2015. So. Um, Last night we made payment for another student. Funny enough, uh, from uh, we, the student is from University of Abuja, so we have sponsored 1,411 so far, and uh, we have a project, ongoing project, um, in which we are raising funds for a thousand students from 50 different institutions in the country. So once that is done, that will be will, will, will release the list by October, early October. So once we do that. Then we'll be having um, over 2,000, maybe 2,500 there about sponsored. But so far, 1,411 mm. sponsored. Okay. And we also have a yes. Now, sometimes when when somebody when I go to the internet and I see somebody telling me, "I'll come, I'll show you how to make money as a Nigerian," I'm like, "Okay, Nigerians don't say that. What they say when you ask them how they're making money, they say, Nagodo. Uh, so this question I'm going to ask you, I don't know how you're going to take it, but if it is possible for others to also do what you do, because I believe it's not because you want to make a name, but because you want to help humanity. But you cannot do it alone. You are not the only Nigerian that can do this. If some other person wants to enter into that kind of a space and do something that you're doing, what does it take? What do you do? to raise the money and to get things done the way you're doing it. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Um, so yes, if you want to enter into this kind of you know, uh, ministry, because it's a ministry, it's not a business, it's a ministry, So if you, and you're basically ministering to human needs. So if you want to enter into this kind of ministry, then first you must be resolute as to why you're going into it. If you want to do it and be you want to do it and be pure, you know, you want to do it and be and be innocent, maybe I should use that word, then you have to be resolute. You have to know that, okay, I'm going into this to help humanity. I'm putting my life on the line for this. And I'm using the word life on the line because there are times that you would have to make sacrifices, especially, you know, in the, in the early stages of, you know, growth. I mean, People are not going to follow you if you don't show that you believe in your own vision. And one of the best, easiest ways to prove that you believe in your own vision is by personal sacrifices. So you would have to sacrifice your comfort. You have to be ready to sacrifice certain things that others might not want to just to see it go. I remember the early days of GPF. Then some of those students that we paid for, I would get jobs outside, outside GPF. I mean, I have personal things I do. I would do those jobs get the money, get paid, and use the money to help the students. Pay for a student, practically speaking, and the truth is, I wouldn't even know where my next meal will come from. You know, but I mean, God sustain me, but I wouldn't know as at that time when it come from. So if you want to do this kind of thing and, and do it rightly, then you have to have that consciousness. And then, of, of course, you'd have to get knowledge on how to run an NGO. The way you run an NGO is 
quite different from the way you run a profit making business. And um, you will have to you know, study maybe affiliate with other NGOs that are into something similar that you're doing, network with them. Then you have to know how to get pa partners and retain partners. Because when you're talking about stuff like this, you are talking about a whole lot of money popped into it. So you and you have to have base for that money. You have to have source for funds. And I mean, the source of funds, I mean, channels of funds are, are humans. So you would have to know human relationship, how to interact with people, how to get people to believe in what you believe in. And then you have to be ready to give them proof. You have to be ready to be transparent. So you doing this kind of thing, you cannot really be so private because a lot of people want to know what their money is being used for. And you have to give reasons. You have to give them, I mean, if you are using the money for what you say you're using it for, then you should be able to show it. That's why when and whenever we, we pay for a student, we post it out there, we post the details out there so anyone could verify it. We have our own database, you know, all those things, just to show that, okay, we're actually using the money for what we say we're using it for. And over time, we discover that the trust level increases. And the more trust level increases, the more people do, because people want to help but they just want to be sure that their money and their resources are being used for the right reason. And of course, you have to have your own administrative system. Build your administrative system and be patient. Don't try to do too much at once because you will thin out. You see, understand that the problem was there before you came. So you want to be here long enough to attend to more of the problems and prefer solution. So take it a step at a time. Build your capacity. Don't take too much that you can handle once. And then let's go do the rest. Does your funding come locally or internationally? Okay, so yes, currently locally, but now we also have, I mean, in the beginning locally, but then we also currently have partners from outside the country who now, you know, fund us. But up until this moment, even um, outside the country, we are talking about private individuals outside the country. So we have... We are just basically, and that's the beautiful thing. I mean, private individuals within and outside the country, and we help um, almost 1,500 students in tertiary institutions. That's quite a lot. So it is just now that we are, now that we have more than enough evidence of our work, our programs, we've had about, I think, um, 56 programs um, since 2015, and we've made, most of them have been major programs. So now we have enough evidence to launch out and reach out to international organizations. Um, but so far, funding has come from private individuals, both locally, internationally, then a couple of corporate organizations within the country. That's it. Okay. It, it's, it's interesting to know. But now, if you were to advise the government on policies to make from your experience with the people who you help, because they will give you particular problems or peculiar problems uh, from your pool of knowledge of uh, uh, you interacting with these people, what kind of policies do you think the government should make, especially now that we have a new government? What kind of policies do you think they should make to make sure that some of these problems that you address, you wouldn't even have a need to address them? Okay. Um, I believe that the government is already doing um, a lot because um, some of those students, we know students that you know, they got grants from a government or a government body or something. So yes, we know that they are doing something, but I think um, I would like the government to have a credible um, committee that would look into the issue of um, dropouts in the country because there are quite many and um, maybe prefer a workable solution. When I mean a workable solution, it would be maybe student loan that they could pay off after graduation, maybe working for a particular ministry or something, that would have been fantastic. I mean, so there's already a system for them to work it out and make payments, fantastic. Just like you have in other countries, you have access to student loans and these loans can be paid off maybe, um, just like I said, you're working. And then, um, of course, grants could also be given you know, to students because it's not it, at, at, at ridiculous as it sound, it's not every one of them that can really work. Um, we have students that we paid for that are special students. You know, when I mean special students, we're talking about you know handicaps, you know, and all that. So, um, but they want to read, they want to study, 
and that will improve their general output in the society. So yes, once the government looks into that area, then we have a particular committee that looks into this matter in detail, and they are transparent about it. And then there's provision for more student loans. Um, there's provision for grants. That would definitely go a long way because these youths, youths are very energetic. And um, if you don't channel that energy positively, it will still be channeled anyway, and it may not be favorable to the society. So the more we have um, um, the government looking into education, I mean, education comes good, and we all want better development. The more, the more government looks into that, the better society we would have in general. Mm, okay. So just a final word to the students uh, in Nigeria and the parents. You know, you've interacted with them, and you know what their worries are, what their fears are. Uh, so we'd just like to take a word from you to the students and would-be students uh, that are out there and just being afraid of going into a tertiary institution because they feel they may not be able to make it. All right. Um, so every student out there or would-be student, um, I would say that uh, do not give up on your dreams. Do not give up on your aspirations. Um, there's really no dream too high to attain. There's really no vision too high for you to, to achieve. Um, look back 150, 200 years ago, it was ridiculous to say that man would fly, you see. But today we have um, air buses that can take up to 800 people. Can you imagine that? Flying in the air for hours. I mean, literally hours, you know. And... Um, that's because someone dared to believe that it's possible. So if something like that could be possible, then your dreams of education, having, you know, graduating from school, getting a good job, they are not far-fetched at all. They are within the confines of reality, if you look at it that way. So you press on. Now, if you are not in school yet and you want to go to school and you know that you don't have the means of income, start planning on it. Start working on something. Don't, um, don't be the kind of, um, youth that would wake up 8, 9 a.m. in the morning when you know you have that kind of challenge in front of you. Don't do that. Wake up early and meditate. Plan your time. See what you can do. See problems you can solve in your neighborhood that would fetch you money. There's money everywhere, really. But you have to look for a need to meet it. It doesn't matter how um, ridiculously low that work may be. It would fetch you as long as it's legal and it's right. It will fetch you resources that you need to propel forward to your next level of achievement. Right? And if you are in school already, and for some reason you are facing severe financial challenges, you could reach out to us. Um, you could reach out to GPF, um, GreatPeopleFoundation.org. That's our website. Or when you check the website, you see our number there. Reach out to us. We could enroll you in the scholarship um, scheme for the next batch. However, you can while doing that, you can also the same thing, the same principle. Start thinking of ways to meet needs, even in your school. It will amaze you. Listen, I'm telling you are things we've told on the graduates, you know, in schools, and it has worked for them. They've been able to even raise money, not just for their school fees, to start businesses within the school because opportunities are everywhere. But if you are if you are so um, encumbered with your problem, it, it, it clouds your thinking, and you think the whole world is crashing down on you. Meanwhile, you just need to put your problem aside a little bit and look around you. Look for solutions to problems. Be that solution to problems. Look for services you can render that will fetch you good money and get knowledge. Even read. It will amaze you what will happen. But regardless of what the situation is, the whole point is do not give up. The regret of not doing what you're supposed to do in time is way, way much more worse than failing. Thank mm. you. Thank you so much for those uh, words. So after this, nobody should say, my uncle did not help me. He's a politician. He's a rich man. He did not help me. <laughs> because you have everything in your hands. You can do what you believe that you can do. We'd like to thank you so much, Joshua, for coming on the show this morning. Thank you. So thank you for having me. Thank okay. you. Well, that was uh, Aluko Joshua, Global Great People Foundation president, and he was sharing with us some of his experiences and how he's been interacting with people who almost dropped out of school but has been able to help 
the major thing why he was here is to make you know that when you live your life, you can give, you can cut a small soup for others, as we say in Nigeria. Okay, he has been able to do that from his meager resources. You too can. It's either you do, you be the Joshua in your community, or you help the Joshua in your community to help others. Like they say in uh, one of the missions, St. Patrick's mission, you either give to the mission by going, or go to the mission by giving. There's always something you can do to better the life of the next man. Remember that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. That is according to Nelson. Let me take that again. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And the more educated people that you have, the more unfit to enslave people that you have. Do you understand that? If someone is educated enough, he is unfit to be a slave. We don't want to be slaves. We don't want to raise slaves. We want to raise people who are confident in themselves and are ready to make our world to work, especially this Nigeria. We need them. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, be sure you do it well. Know that you're right in what you're doing. Then continue. God will help us. We have reached that point in our um, pledge that we say, God help us. So help me God. That's the point we are. So let's believe in God that things will get better while we do the work that we are capable of doing. Until we meet again tomorrow, my name is Nyamgul Agaji. It's been a pleasure having you. And on behalf of the entire team, I say thank you.